Okay, Caroline, we are about to launch into a lot of minutia and familial relations that some of our listeners may not be privy to. You do mean minutia. <laughs> it is so much minutia, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So much, but I am so ready because honestly, there's nothing I like better than a little incest and madness. And that pretty much sums up the situation. Am I right? Yes. So you know, when you go to Thanksgiving dinner and Auntie Carol has brought the cranberry sauce, but Auntie Shirley has always brought the cranberry sauce in the past, and now it's a showdown of who brought the cranberry sauce and which one's better. It's like that, except empires. Slash your uncle is far left and your father is far right, and you're just sitting there praying no one talks. That's probably a more realistic thing. Maybe the cranberries was far-fetched. <laughs> And everyone has the same name, too. That's that's also... Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of juniors. Mm-hmm. Yep. No one is original in this story with their naming traditions. Everyone is related. Everyone is related. And if it's not a petty, petty family dispute that brought around the reign of the Tudors, I'm not sure what it is. I think that's exactly what it is. It was a petty family dispute that killed tens of thousands of people. Yes. Because I want the power. No, I want the power. No, it's my turn. It was my bloodline. You're just some nobody. Except that we're cousins. (laughs) Except that we're cousins. (laughs) They're all cousins. Where shall we begin? All right. We're going to talk about Wales, France, England, and Scotland. And I know this is a Tudor tell-all, but man, does this whole cluster start nearly 300 years before Henry Tudor, eventually Henry VII, took his first breath. Mm. But don't let that scare you or intimidate you listeners because we love this era. Oh yeah, we do. And we are about to drop some hot goss. And if you get lost, you can access digital resources on our show notes and additional posts on our Patreon. Okay, Erica, housekeeping done. Don't keep us in suspense. Go. Welcome to the 13th century. Oh, crap, Erica. Really? Are we? I think it seems a bit extreme to go back that far. Extreme, but needed. (laughs) Have you ever watched Robin Hood, the Disney version with the weirdly hot fox? It is actually a really good soundtrack. It was my favorite movie as a child, evidently. My parents said I watched it on repeat every night. Well, I wanted to be made Marion. Who doesn't want to be made Marion? She was so elegant. She was, and she was so charming. Well, not nearly as charming was Bad King John. Remember the thumb sucker? The one who was always like, a mummy. And sucking his thumb. Yes. That's my favorite. Who knew that was Eleanor of Aquitaine? Who didn't really like John? Wasn't a fan. John's mom was Eleanor of Aquitaine, and she was a kick-ass woman, but John was a whiny little bitch, and she knew it. She didn't like him. She had eight children with Henry II, and then two with Louis that she just had to give up. Two girls, so they didn't really count. That was the precedent that was cited whenever Catherine of Aragon was getting the divorce. This was fine for Eleanor Aquitaine. I guess it's fine for us. Yep. But anyway, the woman had ten children, and when you have ten children, one of them's bound to be a dud. Yeah, if not more. Not more. It's just numbers, right? Statistically speaking. Well, and two revisionist historians are now saying, you know what? Richard the Lionheart? Not a great guy. Pretty good warrior. Maybe not the best king. He was king for 10 years and he spent less than 10 months of that time in Six England. Six months. You know what? Erica, stop. I'm hard stopping on this because none of this was in the discussion. None of it's in this. This is the 12th century and we're not going that far. <clears throat> he, John, back to John, thumb sucking John, <laughs> the, the, the youngest now, son of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry II. And that's all we're going to say about that. Ish. Come on. Come ish. on. Sweetie, this is Tudors. When we do an Eleanor of Aquitaine series, <laughs> this will be great. We're not there. All right. King John. <laughs> This is where we start going south or east, right? Yeah, yeah, east, yeah. The Angevins, his royal house, gained power through the Empress Matilda and Joffrey of Anjou. This royal house made good dynastic matches and they racked up considerable land in France. Eventually, through conquest and inheritance, they actually ruled over more land in France than the king did. A concept that I still struggle to understand, as frankly, I think, did the French king. Yeah. (laughs) He's got to be like, I don't love this. 
This is not comfortable for me. It was very regional powers and very divided in France at the time. It wasn't this consolidated, unified country that we think so. It wasn't. And actually, we're going to talk about that in our Versailles episode. But since they were only dukes in France, now, yes, they were the dukes of the Aquitaine, dukes of Normandy, and dukes, 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 dukes on dukes, right? Dukes on dukes. But because of that, Guess what they had to do? Pay homage to the French king that wasn't really more than a big landholder himself. Right, right. Because they were his vassals, right? They were still... Technically. So technically. technical. And this will come up later, but can you imagine who really didn't want to do that? All of the French nobles, I imagine. But likely, I'm going to guess that the kings of England were especially annoyed by this little detail of being vassals the king of France. A little annoyed by that detail. And um, it's slightly frustrating to be your own country's king, but still have to pay homage. Right. And somehow the English just did not want to pay the French. I don't know why they can't just whip their crowns out and measure. Well, the Angevins, now sadly represented by I want mommy, John, were known for their sharp tongues and quick tempers and supposedly... It was a gift from the devil himself, their, quote, ancestor. How pleasant. That is legend, which some sources think they made up themselves, but no matter the origin, the noble line actively purported this rumor. I believe the phrase was, from the devil they came, to the devil they will go. St. Bernard said that about the Angevin's devilish history. Funny that you say that because I found sources that said it was Henry II who actually said that about himself. I can see that too, knowing a little bit about Henry II, and by a little I do mean a lot. (laughs) Through the line, they would say that. Yeah. Both Henry II and Lionheart said it. I can also see Louis of France, Louis VII of France, saying that about Eleanor of Aquitaine. I mean, yeah. He thought she was a temptress. He was super sexually attracted to her, but didn't want to touch her. But couldn't seal the deal. couldn't seal the deal. He was uncomfortable. I just, I can see him doing really weird things in private. Oh, gross, Caroline, gross. But I think I'm right. He was- Well, he was his second son. So he, yeah, he was educated for the church. And then when he was all of a sudden, nope, just kidding. You have to marry this hot girl who is your age. Lucky you. He just couldn't, you know what? This is again, again, wrong. Right. Stop. Wrong dynasty. Uh, Okay. Yeah, wrong dynasty. But this whole concept is a whole other take on the divine right of kings, am I right? Uh, The devilish right of kings, sure. Devilish John, the last of the Angevins, and youngest son to the great leader Henry II, was never meant to be king. No. He was... Son number four. Son number four. You just don't need heir, spare, spare, spare. Usually. He was known as John Lackless, so he had no land. Lackland, because he was the final little brother and he wasn't intended to inherit much and he constantly whined. I want more land. You guys have everything. Wee, wee, wee. Anyway, so life in the Middle Ages sucks and it's precarious. People die all the time. Oh, and here we go. Sadly for the English, his big brothers all died childless, leaving thumb sucking John Lackland as tyrant. Historian Ralph Turner claims John possessed dangerous personality traits such as pettiness, spitefulness, and cruelty. I also saw it cited that the greatest service he ever did for his country was to die. (laughs) (laughs) I do hope that's not my epitaph. That's a rough one. That's a rough one. The best thing you've ever done is die. That's even worse than Ivan the Terrible. That is worse than Ivan the Terrible, although I could probably say the same thing about him. Yeah. Basically, he was just a little drama king. I know that the Robin Hood portrayal isn't quite fair. Yeah. But it's damn close. And the moniker John the Bad makes sense. He somehow managed to lose So many of the English crown's lands in France. It was just shocking. And, and he was the one that was forced to sign the Magna Carta. Yes. Which was this huge document slash middle finger to John and his tyrannical ways. The Magna Carta made it painfully clear that the king and his government was not above the law. It was a big blow to the monarchy. Yeah. Limiting for the very first time powers of a king. And to make things worse, John the Bad dies. I mean, not many people were upset about that. 
No, maybe not. But then he left the throne, or what was left of it, to his nine-year-old son, Henry. Now Henry III. And you know, nine-year-olds. Excellent leaders. It's never good to leave an elementary school kid in charge. And so Mm -hmm. surprising absolutely no one, Henry III learned nothing from his dear papa and continued to spend an ordinance amount of money desperately trying to reclaim the recently lost lands in France. In terms of our story, his two children are really important. Or two of his children. Two of his children. There are more. There are more, but yes, two are really important to our story. And one you will know from Braveheart, Edward I, the Malleus Scotorum, or the Hammer of the Scots. Also known as Edward Longshanks, dude was super tall for his century, which is a genetic trait that you'll see come again and again in this line. And... It was really good for battle because, you know, longer arms meant that your sword penetrated first. Yeah. It's like just a little bit safer for you. Yeah. The second most important kid was Henry III's daughter, Margaret, Queen of Scotland. And here, my friends, is where we travel north, leave England and France for just a moment and enter Scotland. Margaret married Alexander III. At ages 10 and 11, respectively. Yes, another child wedding. There will be so many in this episode. I was rather appalled. It's shocking. (laughs) It's shocking the ages these people were married. Four and six is coming up. Uh, But they weren't allowed to consummate it until later. Quite frankly, at 10 and 11, I had no idea what was what, and I certainly didn't know about the birds and the bees. They were kept apart, and Margaret really liked him and had a slight crush, and so she actually wrote to her parents and demanded that she be allowed to have sex with her husband. Yes! She was like, I just want to sleep with him, and they won't let me hang out with him. A delegation was sent because she made such a stir. (laughs) She made such a fuss. Mommy, I want to sleep with him. No. I I don't know what I would do if my kid said that. What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> let's just move. Let's just, let's just, let's move just on hope and pray that. that we don't have to send them to a foreign court and then be begged to let them sleep with their husband. Ballsy. Not important. But the listeners just wanted to know. This is the juicy part of history. The stuff that turns a Wikipedia entry into a real person with wants and needs and desires and... Death? Yeah. Because Margaret and Alexander did their duty and had three children. Margaret, who married Eric of Norway. So original with the name. (laughs) Alexander, who was intended to inherit. And then David, the spare heir. But fate, it seems, intervened. Exactly. Son David, the spare, died as a teen. And then Alexander died too, leaving a young widow who was sadly not pregnant. But they did have to wait to make sure. Yeah, they did. Stared her for a couple months like, are you? Are you not? And so these sad deaths were followed by Margaret's passing, leaving only a daughter. Also named Margaret. Also named Margaret. And only a daughter. How rude. I guess it's time for Alexander III to remarry and start procreating again. (laughs) Well, he tried, but he died. Oh, more deaths. Okay, awesome. Yeah. King and Queen of Scotland, dead. Children, dead. No grandsons. Who does that leave us? Margaret's only daughter with her husband, Eric II of Norway. Also a Margaret. Three Margarets in a row. Margaret the Maid of Norway. Erica? Norway is far away. We have already taken us back three centuries. It's not on the list. We're traveling off course. What are you doing? I I know. I, I know. But it is significant because she was betrothed to her <clears throat> grand uncle's son. What kind of cousin that is, I'm not sure. But want to take a gander at who that was? I don't know off the top of my head. Edward II of England, known at the time as Edward of Carnarfon. So that was the fourth son of Edward I, Mr. Longshanks himself. But it doesn't really matter because before they could wed, the maid of Norway went to Scotland to reign as queen, but um, (laughs) died of food poisoning on the transit. That is a terrible way to go. Yeah. No, thank 
thank you. No thank you for me. Unable to leave the chamber pot? No. So she was the last legitimate scion of William the Lion, whose line had ruled Scotland since the 12th century. And was now, sadly, defunct. This threw the succession of Scotland into disarray. Thirteen men laid claim to the throne. So many choices. How will they choose? Edward I being the king just to the south. You mean that little kingdom called England? You know, the one we're supposed to be talking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so whatever. Yes, but he was kind of an important dude. At least before he started hammering the Scots. Yes, so pre-hammering, Edward I, whose fourth son had just been on the brink of becoming the next Scottish king, was now asked by the guardians of Scotland to arbitrate who would be the king of these 13 claimants. So they let their closest neighbor, and therefore the person most likely to invade them, pick their new monarch? Did that really seem like a good idea at the time? Hindsight is 2020, I guess? I don't know. Listen, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, uh, No. Edward deemed John Balliol as the man with the best claim based on male primogeniture. Or the first legitimate child law. That's a male, yes. It doesn't actually have to be a male to be primogeniture. It just has to be the first child. Is it absolute primogeniture or regular primogeniture? Oh, good lord. I, you know what? Never mind. First yeah. legitimate male child. Boom. Minutia. But he was not the best claim via proximity to the bloodline. So he's not the closest related. He's just the closest related through the all male side. Right. Skipping all the women because, you know, they're unimportant. They're just whims. This is ridiculous. But go on. Edward I chose John Balliol to be King of Scotland and then immediately began to undermine the freshly minted king's authority because... I want to say shocking, but I mean, duh. Edward now saw Scotland as a feudal vassal state, similar to how France views England. Right. And continually picked on poor little John Balliol until the Scottish nobles said, look, enough is enough. And they took affairs of state away from their brand new appointed king slash Edward's vassal and made the fateful decision to ally with France through a treaty of mutual assistance. Called the Old Alliance. I bet Edward was thrilled. Yeah, and considering his family lineage, Grandfather John the Bad and Father Henry III had suffered utter humiliation by the loss of their family's French lands, he wasn't thrilled that his new vassal was now in bed with the French. I feel, I feel it in my waters. There's a war coming. The War of Scottish Independence! What a catchy name! Edward I invades and soundly defeats John Balliol, physically tearing the Scottish arms from the former king's surcoat, nicknaming the fallen king Toon Tabard, or Empty Coat, and then imprisoning him in the Tower of London, everyone's favorite prison. Eventually, John Toon Tabard was released to go to France, but upon searching his baggage, a medieval TSA, they found the royal golden crown, the seal of the Kingdom of Scotland, and a lot of money, gold, and silver. Dupe was prepared, I have to give him credit. And clearly he did not know about the medieval TSA. I mean, who would think? Oops, that metal detector sure went off when your entire (laughs) body is covered in metal. (laughs) So Edward I ordered the crown be offered to the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket at Canterbury, generously allowed John to keep the money to pay for his journey expenses. Basically, England didn't want to foot that bill. No. And then Edward I kept the Scottish seal for himself. So he's just now admitting that he assumed Scotland was just his vassal state. Right. It's not just a, a trophy. He is literally taking the stamp of power. Boom. John Balliol was then released into the custody of Pope Boniface the Eighth, where he lived out his days in general comfort, but without his golden crown or Scottish seal. However, there were still some rebellions in his name, yes? Right. William Wallace, a.k.a. Mel Gibson, claimed to be a rebel in the name of his king, John Balliol. But none of the rebellions really stuck 
until Robert the Bruce in 1306. So effectively, Scotland had no monarch for about 10 years. Right. A decade of Edward I holding on to that little seal and Scotland just running around like chickens with their heads cut off. <laughs> chickens with their heads cut off. That Heads cut off. <laughs> heads cut off. <laughs> off with her head. His head. Their heads. All the heads. Robert the Bruce, or Robert I, was followed by his son, David II. Where his father, Robert the Bruce, was a hero of his people, the greatest warrior of his generation, David was, um, less successful? Actually, most of the time he was just held prisoner in England. Yeah, yeah. And by his nephew through marriage, actually, Edward III. (laughs) Oh, good lord. David had married Joan of England, Edward II's daughter. Another fun child marriage. He was four, and she was a mature seven. Wow, that's... That's a real stretch. But this one stuck because a lot of the later marriages at this early stage didn't actually become a marriage. Like it was all proxy and the children never met. And then it was abolished before anybody had to do anything. But no, these, they had to stick with it. And despite their youth, somehow they didn't manage to have any heirs. Oh, darn. Oh, darn. When David II dies pretty unexpectedly, the crown goes to his nephew, Robert. Name repetition. Will this ever get less annoying? I think not. Robert, soon to be Robert II of Scotland, was the son of David II's half-sister Marjorie Bruce and her husband Walter Stewart. And this is all important because... Because with Robert II, the House of Bruce is no more. Oh, another defunct house. Yep, and is replaced by the House of Stewart. Ah, and this is the regal line that gives us the likes of Mary Stuart, Queen of France, for a little bit, and then Queen of Scots, again, for a little bit. And then finally, James VI, who inherits the crown of Elizabeth I and becomes James I of England, uniting the two crowns. Woo, we did it! Okay, I'm going to put the brakes on there and first say that Mary, Queen of Scots, was Queen of the Scots since she was born, although pretty much in name only. Yes, I get it. She had regents, but she was the Queen of Scots for a while. Living in France and didn't speak English. Okay. Exactly. Nor Gallic. Nor Gallic. That makes it rough. She was also the wrong religion. She was the wrong religion, which would ultimately be her downfall. That and the fact, of course, that she's And kept a marrying woman. people they didn't like. You know what? This is not about Mary, Queen of Scots. <laughs> Yep, yep, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, put on the brakes for now. Back to the thing we were talking about. (laughs) England is under Plantagenet rule. Scotland is working its way out from under their thumb, so they get in bed with France. France is happy to use Scotland to stop England from invading or Mm -hmm. perturb them just a little bit so they can save some cash money. It's expensive. They don't want to pay for ships. Do you want to pay for ships? No. So now we are crossing the channel again to go to France. I can't wait. Let's begin with Philip Le Bon or Le Roy de Fer, right? So the beautiful or the Iron King because he was hard and as beautiful as a statue. Mm-hmm. Honestly, yeah, Philip Le Bon was father to one of the most infamous women of the medieval ages, <laughs> Isabella, the she-wolf of France. Which, oh my gosh. It's not fair. It's not fair. Her negative portrayal is not... But we're not in the contemporary. She was very well liked. Yeah, it's just because later on people didn't like women who were assertive. And so then they painted her in a she-wolf... People liked her Devilish. Then. Yeah, well, it's nice when, you know, she's making your life better. But 200 years later, it's easy to be like, no, she was terrible. That witch. That witch with a B. She was married to Edward II to seal the political alliance with England. Edward II was Mr. Almost King of Scotland. If only Margaret, maid of Norway, hadn't eaten those bad shrimp. Yes, that Edward. Everyone told her shellfish is not a great plan. And that's why the royal family doesn't eat it now. That's right. Instead, he marries the fascinating Isabella. And there's a lot of drama, but eventually she (laughs) overthrows him, her unpopular husband, who was in hot water due to his relationship with a certain handsome nobleman, Galveston. Yes, it's so problematic. When the king has eyes for one man, and one man only, the rest of the nobles, not to mention the king's wife, are usually pretty PO'd about that. She actually wasn't that PO'd, but you are taking us off course. Fine, but my path is so scandalous. 
sure. But let's focus on Philip Le Bon, who has three sons, all of which were crowned King of France in quick succession. Bing, bang, boom. Because all of them died in quick succession. Ah, the Middle Ages. Yeah, you're still the Middle Ages, man. Yeah, because you're taking forever. Sorry. When the last one, son number three, died without an heir, it was the end of the house capet. The house capet was kaput. Oh, I like that. (laughs) That's a a Carolinism. I'm rubbing off on you. Yes, you are. (laughs) Okay, so does it then go to his fully capable daughter, the she-wolf Isabella? Oh, don't be ridiculous. She's a woman. They operate off of Salic law. That uterus thing is such, such a, a problem. problem. But her son, now he's a man. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, though, he is an English man. And not just an Englishman, but the King of England, Isabella and Edward's son. Edward. You are so right. Edward, Edward the, the third. third. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the one who imprisoned John Balliol and left Scotland kingless for a decade. That one, yes. The very one. Back to him. We're back. We made it. But clearly the French are not down with this because that mean England ruled France. Yeah, I can imagine that was not an option, at least in their eyes. No, the nobility wanted Philip de Valois, who was the closest relative of a male line. So basically they went for a distant-ish cousin rather than a nephew because Edward traced his lineage to the former king's sister, making him a sororal nephew and not in line for the throne. Yeah, it's so annoying when the sons of daughters make a claim. Like, get over it. You've got all those womanly genes. It's not gonna happen. Move on. Stop trying to make fetch happen. It's never going to happen. And of course, I'm sure his English crown had nothing to do with the decision. Uh, I mean, absolutely not. Sorrel right? nephew, he's out. Period. Out. Space. But importantly, this is what started the Hundred Years' War in England and France. It does make sense, on paper, that Edward III had a pretty legitimate claim, and I can see why England now felt like they owned France and it had been stolen from them by the French. Right, but here we go. The Hundred Years' War was one of the most significant conflicts of the Middle Ages. For 116 years, interrupted by several truces and five generations, five generations of kings from two rival dynasties fought it out for the throne of the largest kingdom in Western Europe. The war's effect on European history was lasting. Both sides produced innovation in military technology and tactics, including professional standing armies, which were not a thing, and artillery that permanently changed warfare in Europe. Chivalry, which was at its height during the conflict, subsequently declined, and stronger national identities took root in both countries, which became more centralized and gradually rose as global powers. And you will see the nationalism in these two countries for the rest of time. Mm -hmm. It's still there. They didn't have it before, but once literally five generations of not just kings and queens, but peasants. What are those? Forced to live and die. What are those? We're forced to live and die for their country. It does generally help. <laughs> it helps. That was a lovely summation, Erica. Thank, <sighs> Thank you. So you. Much. Thank you. After Philip of Valois, the succession of France was strangely normal, right? <laughs> Ugh. Boring. Philip's son, John II. Now, he was grandfather of Margaret of Anjou, who will become a massive power player later in the War of the Roses. Hold on to that name. Yep. Then passed to his son, Charles V. Then passed to his son, Charles VI, the Beloved. And later, Charles the Mad. <laughs> I do love Charles the Mad. He believed he was made of glass, and he insisted that iron rods be sewn into his clothing to prevent his body from breaking. Pope Pius II actually made notes on his behavior, and it is now known as the glass delusion. And it did exist in a number of different royal lines, probably because they were all incestuously married. So Charles here, Mm -hmm. Charles VI, the mad, the beloved, go, was father to two women who would go on to be queen consorts of England, Isabella of Valois and Catherine of Valois. All right, Isabella... The name sounds familiar, but that's not really fair because all the names are familiar. This is or is not the (laughs) she-wolf. Not the she-wolf. Okay. All right. So Isabella, not the she-wolf. 
Not even a little. No. Not even a little. No, no. So Isabella was the second wife of Richard II, and they got married when she was six. She was the six-year-old girl who married the 29-year-old widower. Yeah, 23-year different. That's not icky. That's fine. It's not icky at all, right? They were supposed to wait until she was at least 12 to consummate this marriage. Anyway, he was eventually deposed. Hold on. Richard II is the son of the English king, Henry III. He gets it, but then it's taken away. By Henry Bolingbroke, later Henry IV. But they didn't end up consummating the marriage because Richard was, you know, killed. And it was a bit creepy anyway, because she kind of saw him more as a father figure. There's, you know what, there's so much to unpack there. Psychiatrists would have a field day. Well, there you have it. And listen, girls, not women, were the victims of warfare and peace. Her marriage was supposed to mend the familial relations that Edward III had broken. While it may have been a tentative peace between England and France, the War of the Roses kicked off in England, and with the deposition of her husband, Isabella was sent home to France, bye bye bye, where she remarried at a more appropriate age and went on with her life. At least she was able to escape before the War of the Roses became a total bloodbath. (laughs) Which leads us to the War of the Roses! Which paves the way for the Tudors, which was in fact the whole point of this setup episode. Yes, yes, yes. It's a lot of backstory. And yes, again, this is a really, really oversimplified breakdown of history and relationships. You could spend several seasons of podcasting just this stuff. And some have, and they're quite good. They are. But please, gentle listeners... Please visit our website, thepithychronicle.com, if you have any questions. Look at our show notes, as well as a fun timeline and a very messy family tree. It's always disconcerting when the branches kind of like swoop back in and marry each other. It's ugh. Makes one feel good to be related to them in some way, I'm sure. I'm not. I'm I mean, I am, but I don't... Robert the Bruce on your side, Robert the Bruce on my side, yeah. Mm-hmm. And now, back to rosy England and its ridiculous war. The War of the Roses kicked off in England during the reign of Richard II of Shakespeare fame. The BBC has a great production of Shakespeare's play of the same title for streaming. While it's harder than the rest of the Henriad to really get into, it is beautifully produced, but I digress. And also, I want to say that Richard II was completely mistakenly portrayed by Shakespeare. indeed. He is seen as cruel and manipulative and evil in the Shakespearean play and that really wasn't his personality I, he was actually a pretty until good guy. the schizophrenia well that's not his fault it's not his fault it's not but he did portray a lot of narcissistic behavior and traits he also oh, and that will be coming back up in the bloodline episode indeed it will mm-hmm. but he also was highly highly orthodox and Killed a lot of Lollards for their, quote, heresy. All right. Anyway, in an episode of Just Rabbit Holes. <laughs> does feel a bit like we're Alice in Wonderland. Rabbit hole after rabbit hole, a drink this potion, a mysterious door, leaving the listeners to wonder how on earth this all fits together. After all, they're all mad here. Well, I certainly am. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> So, if you're familiar with the War of the Roses, then you know that factions between the Lancastrian line and the York line arose in the royal house of Plantagenet, the ruling family of England since... The beginning of this episode. Exactly! Following the death of his father, the heir apparent, and his grandfather, Edward III, Richard II was just 10 years old when he was crowned, and was therefore easily influenced by those at court. Reasonably so, because at 10 years old, right? what do you know? Eventually, Richard ousted some of his Lancastrian relations because they were, quote, plotting at the time. Were they? Were they plotting? They weren't, but man, if that didn't sow the seeds of rebellion. (laughs) This whole thing is based off of something that wasn't real? Pretty much. That is unfortunate. Pretty much. Henry Bolingbroke, Richard II's, quote, upstart cousin who decided he had a better claim to the throne, was sent to exile to the court of Charles the Mad. The French king made of glass. Right. And he remained in exile until one of Charles's fits of psychosis. You know, it's so problematic when the king of France and the king of England both have fits of madness. It's Mm. just... 
unfortunate. It's not great. During that very opportune time, the regent ruler, Louis, the Duke of Orléans, wanted to stir strife in England to keep them from attacking while Charles was out of commission. Actually quite smart. It's actually good son move. Good, good son, son move, right? and it did work because the War of the Roses is a hot mess and they did not have time to deal with France. Right. And thus he Brava. allowed Henry to slip through his fingers and back into England where he mounted a successful rebellion. Sneaky, sneaky. The rather fraught Richard, who was later thought to suffer from, as said before, schizophrenia and narcissistic tendencies, was imprisoned and Henry IV now reigned over England. Hmm. <sighs> Which was actually a pretty difficult thing for Henry to do because they were childhood companions and were very close. So he did take being sent away to the French court very, very hard. Yeah, that was that was hurtful to send your best childhood bud into exile. Right, because he was like, dude, I love you. Why would you think that? And so then it just festered, festered, festered. And he was like, you know what? F that. But I'm going to be king of England. The way he got rid of Richard II, that's not friendly. <sighs> Richard, to his credit, sent Henry IV into exile. Henry IV starved Richard II. There are a lot of suppositions on how he died slash executed slash starved or self-imposed starvation. Like, there's... Come I on. mean, he, he starved, starved him. him. Yes, that's what I think. But there's plenty of people who have theories. Fine. That is not a pleasant way to go. It's not a pleasant way to go. And he only survived a year in prison. And of course, that meant that his young wife, I think she is at this point, what, 10, 11-ish, was then sent back to her daddy, Charles the Mad of France. Right. So that one didn't work out. Yeah. Henry IV had many uprisings to quell as king, including the infamous Battle of Shrewsbury, in which Henry of Monmouth, son of Henry IV, and later Henry V, caught an arrow to the face and survived, beginning his infamous reputation on the battlefield. And you know what? Was it disfiguring? I mean, I would assume. From what I've read, it wasn't super disfiguring, but he did have... Like a dent? I mean, he did obviously have a scar. Yeah. There's actually a lot of medical records on this. How the physician would screw out pieces of the, the arrow tip oh God. per day. Yeah, it's fascinating to read about. It is amazing that they, he managed to survive this and it's probably more yes. because of the physician. Yes. Because generally the medical men just hastened your death, but this one clearly knew what he was doing. Or at least, or at least tried. Just went against the grain. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Henry IV. Henry IV managed to keep his throne and passed it on to arrow-ridden son Henry V, who wasted no time and went after regaining the French throne and England's lands therein. These people... They can never be satisfied with what they have. Rule England. Don't worry about the French lands. I'm sorry you've lost all of the good food and now have to eat blood sausage and spotted dick. But you know what? That's life. I'm sorry. I have <sighs> never once eaten a spotted dick. And that's all I have to say about that. It's a dessert. Mm. Mm -hmm. Charles the Mad was still on the throne. <laughs> have you not heard of spotted dick? Ha do I look like a woman who's ever heard of a spotted dick? It's dessert. It is the traditional steamed pudding with dried fruit, thus the spots, and a custard. No spotted dick for your girl. Okay. Anyway, Charles the Mad was still on the throne, and after the battle... Just <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you put that one in there. I just left it. I... I know. Okay. I know. I know. <laughs> now I'm just giggly. So anyway, <laughs> Charles the Mad was still on the throne and after the Battle of Agincourt signed a treaty saying mm -hmm. he would name Henry V, his successor, and Henry V would become King of France upon Charles's death. The only caveat was that he must marry his daughter Catherine of Valois. Oh, wait, so remember that name? when marrying his first daughter, Isabella, at the ripe old age of six, to Richard, King of England, didn't work out, he just handed over daughter number two, Catherine, to the usurper's son, also named Henry, and said, like, have fun, good luck? Yes, and this was actually during a period of brief sanity that this happened. Oh, this was part of his sane decision making. He was sane at oh. this point, yeah. So, oh. women equal property at that point yeah, in time. Yeah. 
and they were used to make and break alliances. Henry V and Catherine were married long enough to produce an heir, the future Henry VI. And then Henry V promptly kicked the bucket from dysentery. Oh darn, another Oregon Trail death. Love it. I always died in Oregon Trail. Usually from starvation, so I was more like Richard II. Uh, yeah, that was... Sorry. <laughs> was before my time. What? What a miss. Whoops. Anyway, Henry VI was crowned as a child with Catherine acting as his regent for like 2.5 seconds. When someone was like, oh, that girl is totally sleeping with the Duke of Somerset, Edmund Beaufort. Oh, but she is single, so why not let her mingle? Because women can't have power and Edmund Beaufort was too closely related to the former king, which could cause problems for those who were already in the king's ear. <clears throat> the Duke of Gloucester. Heaven forbid that little boy have any kind of a male influence other than his manipulating counsel. Yes. And at least she's keeping it in the family. I, I'm not sure if that's better or worse, honestly. In an effort to prevent the marriage, Parliament of 1427-8 passed a bill which set forth the provision that if the Queen Dowager remarried without the King's consent, who is like a child right now, her husband would forfeit his lands and possessions, although mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. children of the marriage would not suffer punishment. Wasn't that generous of them. So nice. The king's consent was contingent upon his having attained his majority. And at that time, the king was six years old. It's, so she, it's very yeah. cleverly worded. Yes. Whoops. Mm. Whoops. So these rumors, though based on questionable evidence, mm -hmm. prompted a response from her son's regents who objected to Somerset as a possible husband as he was second cousin of Henry V through the legitimized Beaufort line sired by John of Gaunt, who deserves his own episode. Episode, yeah. So he was honestly just too noble. Good Lord, make up your minds. Too noble, not noble enough. Exactly. She needs to find someone who is just right. Yeah, it's like Goldilocks. Did she find one? She couldn't marry another super important and well-connected man. Right. Especially if he was connected through the blood. So a parliamentary statute regulating the remarriage of widowed queens was passed. We talked about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, upon leaving court, Catherine said, I shall marry a man so basely, yet gently born, that my lord regents may not object. That'll show him. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. Why wouldn't she just go back to France? I don't know. I guess her son, she wouldn't leave her kid. He is six and on his own with this, you know, yeah. out for themselves counsel. I want to believe she loved him. Okay. I want to believe. The son or the husband? The son. She pretty much does just that. She marries Owen Tudor and gave birth to three other sons, Edmund, Jasper, and others. So was it three sons or was it... Oh, no, it was three sons. I'm just trying to keep it simple, sweetie. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you've named the third one the others. others. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and others. Edmund, Jasper, and others. <laughs> right. Okay. But do you want to know something seriously juicy? Yes, please. What you got? Historian G.L. Harris suggests that the affair with Beaufort resulted in the birth of Edmund Tudor. Oh. Harris wrote, By its very nature of the evidence for Edmund Tudor's parentage is less than conclusive, but such facts as can be assembled permit an agreeable possibility that Edmund Tudor and Margaret Beaufort were first cousins and that the royal house of Tudor sprang, in fact, from Beauforts on both sides. First of all, I absolutely love the phrase, permit an agreeable possibility. I'm that using the it. most PC thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And second of all, first cousins, but they didn't even know it? Or did they? Was this like a common theory at the time or something that historians have come up with later? No, it, this is newer. It's not, it's not a contemporary thing. So I don't know if Again, like it's that whole like, why will Queen Elizabeth II not allow her genealogy to be done? Because they might find out that no one- <laughs> You've cited this like four times in this series. Because it makes sense. The woman has said, please don't go checking my DNA because, you know, things might explode. If we're talking divine right of kings, if- Yeah. Children weren't who they were supposed to be from. Which, it's 
going to come back up in this episode. Yes, it will. All right, let's go. So with Catherine promptly shipped off to Wales and young Henry VI securely under his advisor's thumbs, he marries Margaret of Anjou. And while the Valois sisters have been daughters of the French king, Margaret here was only a niece. It was a bit of a political loss, really, for England. She didn't even come with a dowry. Literally, France had to scrape together the money just to send her over. And there was something about her coming from lesser noble stock, too. Yes to all but the last. Oh. I, too, have heard she wasn't super well-bred. But I took a look at her lineage and... Her father was the king of Naples, which also at the time included Jerusalem, Sicily, and one other random one. I do love that Naples and Jerusalem a pair deal for quite a while. And and so for a hot minute, he had that regnal title and everything. And he was a prince of the blood, meaning she was granddaughter to John II, a former king of France. So why this idea that she was not noble enough persists through the ages, I'm not entirely certain. Especially since the Plantagenets, York or Lancaster, trace themselves back to Joffrey of Anjou. Where she also came from. Right. So maybe, I think it really what it is, is that just compared to a current French princess, a French king's niece just isn't quite as spiffy. Or a granddaughter. I guess not. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, man. When I found that out, because I had always heard, ah, oh, it's a minor principality. It's not that important. Yeah. And then I find this out. Jerusalem seems important. They keep sending people to steal it. I mean, way, crusades. So. Hello. Hello. Now, Henry and Margaret were not successful in the bedroom until 1443, eight years after their marriage and coronation. That's uncomfortable at a time of iffy succession. There was a lot of discomfort about who would succeed the throne. A lot of nobles put their names forward so generously as possible successors. If I have to, if you guys just can't make children. It is my duty. I would feel terrible, but. Yeah, right, exactly. But they were all grossly disappointed when Edward of Westminster was born. Ah, but by then it was too late. For as you say, the seeds were sown. (laughs) Exactly. Even before Margaret's pregnancy, Henry's mental health was beginning to waver. Mm. And he had a complete mental breakdown after England's decisive defeat in the Hundred Years' War at the Battle of Castillon. He was non-responsive catatonic for over a year and did not even show emotion at the birth of his son. Not even emotion, but the sources say did not show a reaction. That is, it's so sad because from what I understand of the couple, they actually had a good marriage prior to this first moment of madness. They really got along well. They even had couple friend besties. They seem like a good fit. If only Henry hadn't gone mad. Yeah, and Margaret, similarly to Isabella, is also called the She-Wolf of France. Right. But it's so interesting to me that regardless of how things actually were, she never took a lover, never left his side, Mm. and even maintained that even in her husband's mental incapacitation, was still the king of England and fought for his right to rule. Not her sons. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. Up until he died. Up until he died. Right. Interesting. And maybe that wasn't so smart on her part. Maybe she should have been like, hey, Edward of Westminster. We get it. He's not, but like here's, yeah. Maybe it would have been different. (laughs) Who's to say? Who's to say? (sighs) All right. So Henry is out to lunch. It really puts a dent in a marriage, doesn't it? It does. No one really trusted Margaret, who was a woman, a French woman. And one who was decently good at statecraft. I just hate it when women, those uterus-having people, have common sense and ambition. It's the worst. I mean, truly. It really screws it up for all the men. It really does. Without either of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, no, they have ambition, just no common sense. (laughs) And no uterus. And no uterus. So prior to Edward's unexpected birth, Richard, Duke of York, was named heir apparent because of his claim to the throne through both of his parents. All right, I'm sure that there's an incest joke in there. I just, give me a second. Well, with his family, you really don't have to look far. (laughs) Richard did not want to let go of his heirship. Fair. I mean, would you? No, 
Like, okay, he's one, but I'm still here as an adult male. I'm still here. Therefore, you should still look at me. Pick me! Somebody pay attention Pick to me. me! Oh, he must have been related Pick to John. Pick me, choose me, love me! <laughs> he was particularly miffed when many of his lands and titles were taken away. To be fair, has she not heard the phrase, don't poke the bear? They were arch enemies. Well, no, and not at first. Not at first. She did not play sides at first, but I guess at some point she was like, well, you want to overthrow my husband, so you are out. Out. So Richard, Duke of York, and Margaret, in the name of her son Edward, very important, obviously, battled it out until his death when his son, also Edward, <clears throat> oh, God. won decisively at the Battle of Taunton and was hastily crowned king, beginning the reign of the House of York. So we have little baby Edward. Westminster. Little baby Edward of Westminster, the miraculous son of former King Henry VI and the French king's niece, Margaret of Anjou, versus big Edward, the uncommonly handsome York boy who was a tall glass of water. And who should we choose? Decisions, decisions. I mean, the handsome big 6'4 Edward was very hastily married to Elizabeth Woodville, a gorgeous widow from the House of Lancaster. I do just love the drama. The York, the Lancaster, coming together. They were star-crossed lovers who just happened to meet. You know, they could have been their own Tudor Rose. It just didn't work out. It just, I mean... It worked out for them. It just didn't work out for anyone. It's not the country. <laughs> yeah. So while her mother, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, had many titles, and was once the highest ranking lady at court, she scandalously remarried for love. Stop it. No. Stop it. I know. No. So her new husband was pretty much a commoner. Yep. And she lost all of her titles and honors. Uh, rude. But it is interesting because that actually makes Elizabeth Woodville the very first time a commoner became queen. And it honestly... It wasn't repeated again, I don't think, until Kate Middleton. So, wow. That's yeah, no, it was not. Scary. Kate Middleton was the next commoner 700 queen. years later. Cool. Yep. Cool. So, you know, it makes all those little girls' dreams to become a princess seem pretty unrealistic. I don't know. There's <laughs> That's just with England. There's been plenty of others. That's true. Other places have allowed the commoners. Yes. So... Little fun fact, Mm -hmm. during the very short second reign of Margaret of Anjou, oh, sorry, I mean Henry VI, Jaquetta was convicted of witchcraft while Elizabeth and her children were holed up in sanctuary. And we are going to talk about that a little bit in an upcoming episode on the health and sanity of Henry VIII. It's one of the reasons we're doing all this back drama. Exactly. I promise it'll pay off in the end. Stay tuned. Now, when Edward IV died, after a full long life, Edward V, his son, was named king, but reigned a mere 86 days before he was usurped by his uncle, Richard III, who put his two nephews in the tower for safekeeping. Oh, Usurper King Richard III dies just two years after he murdered his nephews. <clears throat> I mean, sorry, was forced to take the crown when no one could find the two teenage blonde boys who lived in the tower. Oh, darn. (sighs) Life's tough as a Plantagenet, what can I say? It seems quite precarious at best. Defending his throne on Bosworth Field, Richard fell to Henry Tudor, son of Edmund Tudor, and grandson of fallen Queen Catherine of Valois, whose first son, King Henry VI, went mad and lost his throne to Richard's brother Edward. What a hot flippin' mess. Hot mess Yeah, express. hot mess express. Except it took a long time, actually. Yeah. So a slow, melting hot mess. Magma. Just rolling through. Just rolling. <sighs> so... Henry Tudor, Henry VII, in an effort to make peace amongst all these crazy familial squabbles, took Edward IV's firstborn daughter, Elizabeth of York, as his wife. And that was the end of the War of the Roses. The two houses were finally united by marriage. Why people couldn't figure this out beforehand, I don't know. Symbolized by the new Tudor rose, which was red and white for the Lancastrians and the York. Now you may be asking yourself, 
Tudor. I thought this was the war between Lancastrian and York. As we said, Catherine of Valois, that pesky French princess who was ousted by her son's counselors, married for love to the lowly Welshman named Owen Tudor. The loving couple went on to have three sons, the eldest of which, Edmund, married Margaret Beaufort, who had her own claim to the English throne. So when those two combined their bloodlines, they made a very incestuous but highly placed son, Henry the Seventh, Tudor, to be the seventh. I also want to mention that Owen Tudor was not some nobody. While Wales was not as prestigious of a land as France or the Holy Roman Empire, it was still feudal and still had lords and kings. And believe it or not, Owen, Catherine's lowly second husband, was of the nobility and descended from Llewellyn the Great, who was the OG Prince of Wales, and two other kings from Welsh kingdoms. Let's stop acting like this guy was some kitchen boy. Ooh. So Henry Tudor, therefore, is descended from the French nobility, the Welsh nobility, and the Lancastrian claim for the English nobility. And when he marries Elizabeth of York, their children now also include all of that plus the York nobility. So they're just bursting with blue blood. Oh, so much blue blood. And not to mention, we haven't even talked about how they tie in with France and the Holy Roman Empire and so much stuff they so are much stuff. so incestuously royal they are so royal so, so royal, royal that they have three heads no that's not right and it's not over yet oh god <laughs> so here we are the valois are still on the french throne the tudors just established themselves in england and the stuarts are holding down scotland ish ish I mean, they're doing okay right now. Right now. Not so much in the future. No. But frankly, none of these people are going to do well in the future. Moving on. That's true. Henry VII and Elizabeth of York produced three children who survived into adulthood, all three of which would ascend. Well, actually, technically, Arthur survived into adulthood. He He just He was 16. He was... He wasn't... 17. he He still couldn't vote. I don't think they got to vote back then. I mean, they didn't get to vote. Fine. 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 Okay, three that we get to consider because one of them died. Died. Yes. Which was a very important death, but we will handle that in another Mm -hmm. day. Mm Mm-hmm. Another day, another time. Okay. All three of which would ascend to these three thrones. However briefly. Right. Henry VIII to England, Mary as Queen Consort of France, although, like you said, short-lived, and Margaret as Queen Consort of Scotland, although her time as Queen was really, really unhappy. The worst. She is the saddest person in history that I can think of. Nothing good happens to this poor woman. It really doesn't. There's just no silver lining. Suck, 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 suck. Used, 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 used. Betray, 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 betray. Right. The Tudors would face their own succession crisis in the near future, but it would all resolve when King James VI came to the throne after Elizabeth I, uniting the Tudor and Stuart lines. And that, my friends, is that. We made it! Thank God! You stayed with it! (laughs) So this whole thing was meant to give you back information. It's a fun little story on its own, but if at some point in a future episode we're talking about someone and you're like, wait, who the heck is that? You can come back and reference this. And we are going to put up a nice little timeline with some of these big important things on our website, along with a family tree that's pretty messy. This tree is not doing well. It's had a few lightning strikes. It needs to be chopped down. It needs to be chopped down. (laughs) But instead, it's just going to continue to grow in on itself. However, it's a really good representation of what the heck is happening and why these people continually go to war for claims that just aren't necessary. Not to mention everyone uses such different succession laws. Sorrel, Absolute primogeniture, primogeniture, male primogeniture, which is called something else in Latin. Salic law, non-salic law. It's just a wild ride. Mr. Toad and all. Which of these guys would be Mr. Toad? I don't know, there are a lot of toads, man. A lot of toads. Oh, okay. To find your prince. There are a lot of toads in this one. But you gotta kiss a lot of toads. So you get the frog. Next week, we will be back, and we will be doing an episode on Henry VIII. 
And while he's been covered a lot, and there's a lot to say, we're actually going to look at some... And a lot to cover. And a lot to cover, uh, physically as well. Yeah. We're yeah. actually going to talk about his health. And if perhaps we can blame something other than just his selfishness for the downfall of his many wives. And we're going to look into a lot of different maladies that the man may have had. Or maybe not. Maybe he was just an asshole. Or maybe he was just terrible. Maybe yeah. he was just the worst. So it'll be up to you to decide, and we will see you next week. In the meantime, don't forget that we do have a Patreon where you can support the podcast, and you can please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We put up tons of awesome little graphics. Erica here is a whiz, and we keep you updated with interesting historical facts as they pop up in the world. And that, my friends, is that. I'm Erica. And I'm Caroline. And, and we, we are, are Pithily Yours. This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!